Welcome to Gospel Commission. My name is Christopher. Today we're going to be discussing Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 9. Uh, We're going to cover the issues related to whether the unfaithfulness of Israel has nullified the faithfulness of God and ruined the plan of God, and also discuss who are the descendants of Jacob in reality, who are the true Israelites indeed. So let's go ahead and start here in Romans chapter 9, and let's read verse 6 through 9. It is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are descendants of Abraham. But in Isaac shall your descendants be called. So those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as descendants. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Now this is part of a series that we're doing on Romans chapter 9, which is also a part of a greater series that we're doing, chapter and verse, where we go through different controversial or difficult to understand passages in the Bible and seek to understand them in their context and what is actually being taught through them. So in the last video we covered Romans 9, 1 through 5, and today we're going to jump into these verses right here. So it starts off here in verse 6. It is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So why why does he mention here, it is not as though the word of God has failed? Because the Israelites for whom The gospel had been, they had been prepared for the gospel. They had been prepared for the promise of the coming of the Messiah, of salvation, the new covenant. They had been prepared for that, but whenever he came, they rejected him. And so then the question that's on Paul's mind as he's going through Romans chapter 9 all the way through chapter 11 is the question of, well, if they rejected, if they rejected the Messiah, then doesn't that cancel out God's plan for Israel? So, here he says, is it, not, it is not as though the word of God has failed. So he gives us the answer up front. No, the plan of God has not failed. What God intended, he is still going to fulfill. What he promised, he's still going to bring to pass. And he tells us, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And he's going to tell us why his plan is going to continue as it was from the beginning. Because God never counted everybody that's a descendant of Israel as part of God's chosen people, as part of Israel. So let's look at this. In verse 6, it is not as though the word of God has failed. Let's jump back to Romans chapter 3, because this is where he began to discuss the issue. Paul started talking in Romans chapter 2 and the beginning of Romans chapter 3 about this problem of who are the true uh, Israelites of God, who are the true people of God, as well as what about the unbelief of Israel, how does that uh, impact God's plan in the earth. So go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 1 through 4, and he asks this question, what advantage then does the Jew have, or what profit is there in circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because the oracles of God were entrusted to them, as we saw in Romans chapter 1 through 5, that all the promises, all the covenants, everything had been promised to and through them. Verse 3, what if some did not believe? Would their unbelief nullify the faithfulness of God? So we see here, this is the same context that's being discussed in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. It is not as though the word of God has failed, even though the Israelites have not believed as a majority. Verse 4, God forbid, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and you may prevail in your judging. So he says, God forbid, no, the faithfulness of God is not going to be canceled out, is exactly what he says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6. He says, it is not as though the word of God has failed. So the unbelief of the large part of Israel has not destroyed the plan of God. Many people, when they look at the Old Testament, they go to the Old Testament passages and the promises that are given about the new covenant, about the coming of Messiah and all these things, and they look at those only through a rationalistic and uh, a mindset. They look at it uh, in a way that says it has to be fulfilled exactly the way that it was said. 
They don't look at it from the New Testament perspective where we look at the teaching of the apostles who had the revelation of Jesus Christ, who Jesus, in, in Luke chapter uh, 24, opened their minds to understand the scriptures, the Old Testament. And at Paul, as Galatians chapter 1, talks about receiving the revelation of the gospel through Jesus Christ. And so when we come to those Old Testament passages... The only way to interpret the Old Testament is through the teaching of the, uh, the New Testament. Through the apostolic teaching is how we understand the Old Testament. We don't just go back to the Old Testament and understand it in our own way or our own rationalistic way and say, well, if it's said like this, it needs to be fulfilled like this. No, the New Testament, the apostles of Jesus Christ will tell us how the Old Testament passages are fulfilled in the New Covenant and in Jesus Christ. So it is not as though the word of God has failed. No, indeed, God has fulfilled all of his promises in Jesus Christ. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. So the, the plan of God has not been thwarted. It has not been made nullified. So it's not plan B. So, you know, in dispensationalism, there's a, a, a system of thought that says God sent the sent Messiah to the Israelites and he was going to bring his kingdom on earth through them, but they rejected him and they crucified him. And so God had to look at that and say, okay, well, I'm going to put off what I'm doing in the kingdom of God. I'm going to put that off until later. First, I'm going to turn to the Gentiles and I'm going to give them salvation by grace through faith. And then whenever they're raptured at the end of time, then I'll come back and I'll work with the Jews and bring about the kingdom of God through Messiah on earth. They say, this is plan B. This is not plan A. No, what the scripture confirms and what, the, what Paul is teaching here is that no, the, the promises of God have not been nullified. His faithfulness is still intact. His promises are still intact and they came to fulfillment through Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't mean that all things have been fulfilled that are written in the Old Testament. But when Jesus Christ came, that was the core of what was promised in the Old Testament and it's been filled in Jesus Christ. Now he's seated at the right hand of God until... All his enemies are made his un, put under his feet, and he comes back to reign in glory. So here, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Now Israel is the name that was given to Jacob. The name that was given to Jacob, he was changed from Jacob, which means supplanter or deceiver, and was changed to Israel, which means a prince with God. So that's a, a very important thing to understand that he was originally considered a supplanter because even though his older brother came first, then he was the one that got the birthright and the blessing. For they are not all Israel who are descended. In other words, everybody that is born with the DNA or the lineage directly from Jacob, that doesn't mean they are part of the Israel of God. That doesn't make them part of God's holy people. Just because somebody is born of a certain race, just because somebody is born uh, of a certain bloodline, doesn't make them part of God's chosen Israel. So, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. They are not all part of God's people who are descended from Jacob. When we look at this, we need to understand uh, how do we know who God's Israel are? His people. This is the question that's going to be brought about in much of the rest of Romans chapter 9 is who are God's people and who are not God's people? And right here he's telling us that not everybody that has a lineage, not everybody that's born a Jew, makes them part of God's chosen people, Israel. Let's look at verse, uh, let's go ahead and jump over to Galatians chapter 3 and consider. Uh, what Paul's going to do here. Actually, let's, let's, let's stay here in Romans chapter 9 and look real briefly at what he's doing right here in these verses. He's saying, okay, there's Abraham and God was given the promise that through his seed, all the nations would be blessed. And then God comes and he narrows it down and he says, it's not all of children, uh, not all the children of Abraham, but only through Isaac shall the promise come. And so we think, okay, so everybody that's born of Isaac then is going to be part of God's people. And the answer is no, because then whenever Jacob and Esau are born, God says it's not through both Jacob and Esau, but only through Jacob that the line is going to come. So then Jacob had the 12 tribes of Israel and those that nation grew and it came to the point 
where they had already come back from exile, the Messiah already came, they rejected the Messiah, and now the question is, are all those people part of Israel because they were of, they were of the bloodline of Jacob? And the answer is going to be no. The, the, just in the same way that God limited it from Abraham to Isaac and from Isaac down to Jacob, now he has limited it down to Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham. Only through him are the people of God going to be recognized and known. Only through him do we receive the, the, the calling and the election as God's chosen people. If we're outside of him, whether we're Jew or Gentile, we are not God, part of God's people. But if we are in Jesus Christ, whether we are Jew or Gentile, we are part of the people of God. Now let's look at Galatians chapter 3 and see this spelled out for us here. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 says this, Now the promises were made to Abraham and his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, meaning many, but and to your seed, meaning one, who is Christ. So God has now limited, not only through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but now only through one of the descendants of Abraham, through Jesus Christ. Only if we are related to him, only if we are connected with him through faith, only if we are identified with him, are we counted as part of the Israel of God. Only in him are the promises of Abraham made full. And go, we jump over here to verse 26. You are all sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we are connected to Jesus Christ. No longer through lineage. Somebody in Israel, uh, when they were born, they were already connected to Jacob because they were born from that line. From birth, they were connected to the people of God. But now, it's no longer through birth, but it's through faith in Jesus Christ. We are connected to the seed through Jesus Christ, through faith, and through that we become sons of God. Verse 27, For as many, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So when we identify ourselves with Christ in bapti baptism, when we connect ourselves to him through faith, that is when we put on Christ and we are part of Abraham's seed and part of the chosen people of God. We become part of Israel. 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, some people that are watching these videos are getting upset and saying, you're using other passages, you're not just going through... Uh, Romans chapter 9 alone. Yeah, yeah, it's true. We're not just reading Romans chapter 9. Everybody can do that at home by themselves. We're referencing to the passages that are related, either those that are in Romans chapter 9 themselves or to those passages that are of a similar context written by the same author that are bringing us understanding of what he's talking about. Sometimes we will jump even into the teaching of Jesus or Peter in order to confirm that the teaching is not only Paul's, but it's the teaching throughout the New Testament. But here, look at this. It says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Jump back to Romans 9, verse 6. It is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Verse 7. Nor are they all children because they are descendants of Abraham, but in Isaac your descendants shall be called. So those who are of the children, those who are the children of the flesh, that is, those who are of the natural lineage of Jacob, those who are the children of the flesh, are not the children of God. But the children of promise are counted as descendants. Who are the ones that receive the promise? Those that become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So here, Paul is telling us the same thing he tells us in Galatians chapter 3. That it's through Jesus Christ and through faith in him that we become part of the seed of Abraham and we're connected to the promise that was given to Abraham. It's not through our lineage, but it's through the promise. Verse 9, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Now we say, okay, well, that's in Galatians. What about Romans? Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, uh, verse 13 through 17. It was not as though the law, as not through the law 
that Abraham and his descendants received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, not through the law and not through lineage, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law become heirs, who are those that are of the law? Those that are part of Israel, that are circumcised into the house of Israel, that are born uh, into Israel. For those who are of the law become heirs, faith would be made void and the promise nullified. The promise of God to Abraham would be nullified if we went through the law. Why? Because in Galatians chapter 3, Paul also tells us that even though the law was given, it was given after the promise had already been ratified, after there was already a promise made to Abraham, and that promise was already sealed, there was already a certainty that it was going to come to pass, then God gave the law of Moses for a different purpose to lead people to Messiah. But once Messiah comes, they no longer follow the law, they follow Jesus Christ through faith. So faith would be made void and the promise nullified because the law produces wrath for where there is no law, there is no sin. Therefore, the promise comes through faith. Okay, so in Romans chapter 9, when it said, when it, when it says here, Romans chapter 9, it, it says, so, verse 8, so those who are children of the, so those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as descendants. Who are the children of promise? Who are those that are the children of promise? It's not those that are somehow unconditionally, without any sort of uh, condition, elected by God just because that's what he determined in some uh, divine sovereign, sovereign decree. But instead, the children of the promise are, as it says in Romans chapter 4, the teaching of Paul in the same book, it says, it says that the promise would be certain to all the descendants, not only those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 16, therefore the promise comes through faith. We become the, the people of Isaac or the promise of Isaac. We become the, the children of promise through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Romans chapter 9, verses 7 through nine are speaking of that we are children of the promise we're the children of abraham through faith this is not talking about any sort of idea of of tulip unconditional election of any sort of any sort of that philosophical system it's referring to the same thing he spoke about in Romans chapter 4. He also talked about in Galatians chapter 3. And it's taught by Jesus. It's taught by, uh, it's taught by Peter. It's taught throughout the scriptures that we are saved by grace through faith. And when we come into Jesus Christ, we become the children of Abraham through faith. We become the Israel of God. That's how the Israel of God are chosen. So, Israel has now been reconstituted. When it was originally founded, when we looked at Israel, to be part of Israel, you would need to be two things. Either you would need to be born an Israelite and circumcised and to keep the law, or you would have to come into the Israelites, be circumcised, and then keep the law. So there would be either way you would be connected with this people that were from a, nas a national lineage, a natural lineage, and they you would connect yourself to them through the law of Moses, through circumcision, through obeying the feast, all the, the Sabbath days, all the things that were made in that covenant, you would keep those things and through that you would be part of the national Israel. But here, when we get here, we see that now God has reconstituted Israel. That means he's reformed Israel and made a new uh, method for becoming part of the Israel of God. It's no longer because you're from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you can trace your lineage back to them. And it's no longer because you joined those people through uh, uh, that, that lineage through are through obedience to the law of Moses, circumcision, and all the other commandments that are in the law. It's no longer that way that you become part of Israel, but instead we become part of Israel through faith in the seed of Abraham, the one seed, Jesus Christ. When we come into him, when we identify with him, when we trust in him, we are made one with him. There's no Jew nor Gentile. The wall of division has been broken down and now God has one holy people made of Jew and Gentile and all of them trust in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Israel has been reconstituted through Jesus Christ. 
Used to be by lineage, used to be by law, but now it's through faith and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how Israel is defined. Let's go back to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Now let me make this clear. Some people will say that, oh yeah, we need to keep the law of Moses, but we don't need to be circumcised anymore. My friend, circumcision is part of the law of Moses. You can't keep the law of Moses while ignoring circumcision. You can't throw out circumcision to keep the law. Some will say, well, the Sabbath is more important than circumcision. No, the Sabbath was broken in order so that a baby could be circumcised on the eighth day so that the law of Moses could be kept. So circumcision is a very part, a very important part of the law of Moses. Yes, it was given to Abraham, but it was re emphasized within the law of Moses that people that were not circumcised could not become part of the Israel of God. So whenever somebody comes and says, we need to keep the law of Moses, but we don't have to be circumcised anymore, my friend, they're missing the point. They're missing the understanding. Verse 9, does the blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? We are saying that faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith that he had while being uncircumcised. His point is simply, Abraham was justified by grace through faith before he was circumcised. So that he might be the father of all who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them also and the father of circumcision to those who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while still being uncircumcised. So now, whether Jew or Gentile, they can become part of the people of God just because they're circumcised, just because they're of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and just because they keep the law of Moses does not mean they are part of the Israel of God. In order to be part of the Israel of God, they must have the faith of Abraham, who, all, the, who believed in the one who is able to raise the dead, even as we believe in God who raised his son from the dead and are justified through faith in God raising his son from the dead. And so the people of Israel, the children of Abraham, are recognized and they are brought into the fold through faith in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this again, as we've referenced already in Galatians chapter 3, verse 15 through 18, that God made uh, Jesus the seed, and it's through him that Israel is recognized and reconstituted through obeying and submitting to him, we become part of the Israel of God. Now let's jump over to uh, ask the question going, let's go back to Romans chapter 9. Not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. It's not through the natural lineage, through the bloodline. Romans chapter 2, Paul already started to speak of this. If, if someone says, well, you know, you're jumping to all these passages. Yes, these are the passages that Paul already referenced these issues, and he's bringing it back up more fully in Romans 9 through 11, but he already referenced it in Romans chapter 2 and Romans chapter 3. So going back to Romans chapter 2, verse 26 through uh, 20, 29. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteousness of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Now, the righteousness of the law. How do you have the righteousness of the law if you're not keeping the law by being circumcised? Because the righteousness of the law is referring to the law of Jesus Christ, which is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He fulfilled it by fulfilling the Sabbaths in himself, the feasts in himself, the, uh, uh, all the, the new moons, all those things are fulfilled in Christ. Those were a shadow. He is the fulfillment. But the law, the righteousness of the law was fulfilled in his teaching. That's why he said in Matthew chapter 7 that uh, 
So as you would have other people do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 13 says all the commandments in the law and references those that are related to moral issues and relating with other people, that if you love your neighbor as yourself, you will keep the whole law. This is the righteousness of the law. This is the, right, this is the law that believers are under. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 19 through 21, it tells us, that we're not under the law of Moses, but we're still under the law of Jesus Christ. The law of Jesus Christ is the righteousness of the law. It takes what was in the law of Moses that was universal, that was righteous, that was moral, that was true, and brings it in and, and sums it up with love God and love your neighbor. As Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, whenever uh, Luke chapter 10, whenever a man came to him and asked, you know, uh, what's the greatest command in the law? Jesus asked him, How do you, what do you say? He said, love God, love your neighbor. And then Jesus said, true, do this and you will live. And so we need to understand that that's the law of Christ, to love God and love your neighbor. And that's the righteousness of law. So even though a person is not, uncir is not circumcised, but they're walking in Jesus Christ, they're trusting in him, submitting to him, walking after his law and his commands, that is the righteousness of the law. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteousness of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? We touch on this in the video over Romans chapter 2, if you want more clarity on that issue. Verse 27, will the uncircumcised one who is righteous by nature... If he fulfills the law, not judge you who by the letter of the law and circumcision violate the law. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is external in the flesh. In other words, not everyone that is of Israel is part of Israel. Just because they've been born from the, uh, the line and the lineage of Israel. Jacob doesn't make them part of the Israel of God. Verse 29, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart by the spirit and not by the letter. His praise is not from men, but from God. Those that repent of their sin, submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in him as the king above all kings, the savior of all men and, tr and submit to him and to obey his commandments and to live for him. Those people are filled with the Spirit of God. They're circumcised within themselves, uh, in, within themselves by the Spirit of God, given a new heart. The law of God is written on their heart to love God and to love their neighbor. And then by the Spirit of God, they put sin to death, walking in submission to the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit so that ultimately they will reap eternal life. They turn away from the works of the flesh because those that live according to the flesh will die. Those that sow to the flesh will reap corruption, but they put sin to death by the power of the Spirit of God. These are those that are a Jew. If you are, uh, if you consider yourself uh, a Christian and you're walking in the fear of God, trusting in Jesus Christ, submitting to him and walking by the Spirit of God, my friend, according to the New Testament and apostolic scriptures, you are a Jew. You are a Jew by the Spirit of God circumcising your heart, not your flesh. You are a part of the Israel of God. So my friend, going back to Romans chapter 9, uh, we, we, going back to Romans chapter 9, we see. Uh, actually, let's just jump over to Galatians 3. Galatians 3 verse, Galatians 3 verse 11 and through 14. Saying the same thing. Now, it is evident that no man is justified by the law in sight of God. The just shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, for the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, so that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This is how we become part of the people of God. This is how we receive the new covenant promise that says he will circumcise not our flesh, but our heart. Take out the stony heart and give us a new heart. That he will write his law on our hearts. This is how this takes place. The spirit of God comes to dwell in us and to lead us from glory to glory, transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, let's jump over to John chapter 1. Because John, chap John, the Gospel of John, is actually very similar to the book of uh, uh, Romans. The context is very similar in that it's dealing with, John was writing at a time when 
there was more Gentile believers than there were Jewish believers. And that the Gentile believers, as well as those believers among the Jews, were being persecuted many, uh, in many places by the, uh, the unbelieving Jews. And so he was writing and he was encouraging the, the, the believers that they were the true people of God. This is why you have passages like John chapter 6, John chapter 8. John chapter 8 where Jesus says to the Pharisees, you're children of the devil, you're not children of God. If you were following God, you would listen to his teaching, you would hear him, learn from him, and you would come to me. If you were the children of God, then you would love me because he sent me. But you're not the children of God, you're the children of the devil. And so in the same way, when we go through and we talk about his sheep and not his sheep, and we talk about who those are the children of God, those that are the children of the devil, we talk about God drawing them by teaching them and leading them to Messiah. All these are in the context of this Jewish Gentile controversy. So my friend, even those passages, if you uh, have been confused by those passages and thinking that, that those are referring to you know, irresistible grace and referring to unconditional election, my friend, the context is important and that's not what it's talking about. But that's totally off top of what I'm talking about right now. Let's turn to, uh, well, let's turn to uh, John chapter 3, verse 16 in order to get us some bearing on the context of the book of John since we're jumping into a whole different uh, book here. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is probably one of the most controversial verses in the New Testament. It, when, it was read, when it was written and when it was read for the first time, it would be a very controversial passage. To us, it's the most uncontroversial passage that it possibly exists. But what here Jesus is saying in John 3.16 is God so loved the world. Not that he just loved the Jews, but that he loved all the world, both Jew and Gentile. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life that we can become sons of God and part of Israel, not through our lineage, but through faith in Jesus Christ. John starts this argument back in John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. This is exactly what we're reading about in John chapter, uh, or in, in Romans chapter 9, that the majority of the people in Israel rejected the Messiah, and the question is, well, then what's going to take place if, Jew, if the, the Jews reject Messiah? Then what about all the promises? And what about the fulfillment of all those promises? Is God going to be able to do what he planned to do? Yes, he indeed is, because here was his plan. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Yet, to all who received him, he gave the power to become sons of God, to those who believed in his name. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we become the children of God, who were born not of blood, not of lineage, nor of the will of the flesh, not because we belong to a certain fleshly tribe, nor of the will of man, not because a husband wanted to have children, but of God. We're not born naturally. We're born supernaturally. We're not born by being uh, from only the first time through our mother's womb, but we're born again by the power of God's Spirit, by trusting in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. This is what's being taught in Romans chapter 9. This is why it's important that we understand the context. Otherwise, we miss uh, such a, a key teaching of the gospel, such a, a key uh, tenant of the gospel, that we become part of God's people through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let's go in closing here. I understand that I am uh, taking a, a long time to make the same point over and over again, but that's what these videos, these longer form videos of going section by section through Romans chapter 9 are about, that we're going to go through them and we're going to take our time to understand that this is not uh, just uh, some Ar Arminian reading into the text, trying to find something to disprove Calvinism. My friend, I understand the philosophies of Calvinism. At times in my life, I've leaned more towards them. I've been open to many of the philosophies there. I can give you a good defense of unconditional election philosophically and why God would be just in doing it. So I'm not afraid of the philosophies. I just can't help but find that the text of Scripture is against those philosophies. It's not from Scripture. It's from the philosophies of men like Augustine and others that followed him. So when we come to the Scriptures, we come to the early church writings, this is not what is found. We don't find those philosophies there. Uh, we, we find the, the, the teaching, the plain teaching of the 
gospel in these passages like Romans chapter 9. Not some metaphysical questions, but instead we find the teachings of the Bible in the context in which they were written, that while it was being written, that the Jews were persecuting the apostles as they were preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, and Paul is giving a, an understanding of why there is this problem going on and how it's not a problem for God. And so the the, the church in Rome that had Jews and Gentiles didn't need to fight and be conflicted over these issues because God's teaching and God's ways are clear. That's what he was doing. That's what he was teaching here. And so uh, let's go ahead and look at, uh, you know, here's the question. As Paul's going through, you know, there's the dispensationalist teaching is that the church and the gospel of grace is somehow plan B. I don't know if they use that terminology plan B or not, but in some way uh, their concept is related to that, that God had a plan A, bringing the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews, uh, you know, the Sermon on the Mount and all the commands of Christ and the gospel of the kingdom, and then they rejected, and so now God has switched and he's teaching the gospel of grace and the gospel of grace through faith, and that's primarily to the Gentiles, and whenever the church is taken away, uh, at the pre-tribulation rapture, or I don't know if they teach mid I don't, I don't know what they teach. When it's taken away, then, then God will continue his work in that seven-year tribulation or mid-tribulation will continue the work and bring the gospel of the kingdom again, and, the, and it will be a different way of working with the Jews than he worked with the church. It's not plan B, my friend. This was plan A. Let's go to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Starting in verse 11, we're going to read all the way through 22. Therefore, remember that you formerly, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision in the flesh by human hands, were at that time apart from Christ, alienated from citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. Do you hear the, fam the familiar wording that Paul is using because even though when he's writing to Ephesians or Galatians or to Colossians or to Romans he has a slightly different angle that he's coming at but he's dealing with the same issue he's dealing with the fact that now the the Jews or the Gentiles that believe in Christ have been brought into Israel so in the past they were strangers and alienated from the covenants and from the citizen of Israel, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made both groups one and has broken down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus making peace. What's that one new man? The seed. Who are those that are in him? Whoever trusts in him, identifies with him. Then there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, but all are one in Jesus Christ and all become the seed of Abraham and receive the promise. The one new man thus making peace, and that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, thereby slaying the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, both to the far away Gentiles and to the near Jews. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Who is a Jew but him who is circumcised in the heart by the Spirit of God, who trusts in Jesus Christ, is born of God, not of the flesh? They are the members of God's household. For having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, he is the seed. It is through him that Israel is recognized. It is through him that the people of God are recognized. In whom the entire building tightly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God through the Spirit. For this reason, I, Paul, am the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Verse 1. So, in Romans chapter 9, Paul has kind of conceded to the argument. He goes and he, 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 he's conceded to the argument that, okay, the law came first, the Jewish nation came first, the people of Israel came first, and the church came second. So he concedes to that, and he goes on and uses examples. He says, oh, but now he switches it and says, yes, Esau came first, 
uh, but Jacob is the one that got the promise. Yes, Ishmael came first and he was of, uh, of the flesh, but it's the promise was given to Isaac, the younger one. And so he concedes the argument that the, the Jewish nation came first and the church came later, but he says in the Old Testament even we have the younger receiving the promise, not the older. But here we're going to read something in the book of Ephesians, particularly you start at the beginning of Ephesians where it talks about predestination talking about the church being chosen in Christ before the world began. In Ephesians, he takes a whole different route. He doesn't concede the argument and say that the uh, church came second and the Jewish nation came first. No, he says the church came first before the world began. But here's what we want to focus on. Verse, chapter 3, verse 2. You may have heard of the administration of the grace of God which was given for, to me for you, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery... There's a mystery that was made known to him that I've already mentioned briefly, by which when you read it, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So what is this mystery that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is revealed now in the New Testament to the apostles and to the prophets? What is that mystery? Verse 6, how the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. Going back to Romans 9, even before the world began, God planned this. This is not plan B. My friend, God did not send Jesus to the, the Jewish nation with the gospel of the kingdom. They failed to recognize it. Therefore, God came up with a plan B to deal with the church and the Gentiles in a different way, and then at the end of the age, he's going to come back and deal with the Jews in the first way again. That's not how this works. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that before the world began, God already planned to glorify his son, and through his son, he was going to grant grace to all who would believe in him and grant that he would have a people made of Jew and Gentile, of slave and free, male and female, black and white, that would be joined into one body, and that for all eternity, they would be part of the household of God, that they would rule and reign with God as God's holy children, not just as forgiven sinners, but as those that sit on the throne with Jesus Christ, if they endure to the end, trusting in him, submitting to him, and following his ways by the Spirit of God, putting sin to death and submitting to the law of Jesus Christ, trusting in his grace day by day to not only forgive them for their trespasses, but also to make intercession for them so that they would have the favor of God and that they would receive the spirit of God and they would be able to put sin to death and that grace, by the grace of God, they would overcome ungodliness and worldliness. My friend, this is the teaching of Romans chapter 9. Going back to Romans chapter 9, verse 6 through 9. It is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are descended from Abraham, but in Isaac shall your descendants be called. So those who are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Here, here Paul is comparing Ishmael, the, the children of the flesh, he's comparing with those that were born according to the lineage but don't have faith in Jesus Christ. But the children of promise are those, whether they are Jew or Gentile, that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to find grace and salvation and become the children of God and become the Israel of God. I hope this has been helpful to you. God bless you.